Bobby Sands, a 26-year-old Irish militant serving a 14-year prison sentence, has just won a seat in the British Parliament. With an 81% turnout, he has defeated a unionist, establishment-backed candidate with 51% of the popular vote. He has become the first volunteer from the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, to win a seat in Westminster. As their radio announced the results, Sands fellow inmates in each block of Her Majesty's prison maze cheered, cried, banged their cell doors with their chamber pots. But Bobby Sands was in no physical condition to generate any excitement himself. In my position, he was heard saying, you can't afford to be optimistic. Sands' use of the phrase, in my position, grossly oversimplifies what was certainly one of the most dire set of circumstances any electoral candidate has ever been in. For at the time, Sands was not only in a prison cell, he had also been on hunger strike for 41 consecutive days, could barely move, and was losing his vision. Although the government of Margaret Thatcher in London tried to dismiss its significance, Sands' electoral victory was one of the most pivotal moments in almost half-century-long conflict in Northern Ireland which was known then, as now, as the Troubles. The hunger strike began by Sands and nine fellow inmates was a planned and coordinated action to protest their treatment by the British authorities. But his campaign for the British legislature was very much a result of an unexpected opportunity created by the sudden death of a sitting MP named Frank Maguire. The vacancy left by Maguire's death was to be filled in by a special by-election called in the UK constituency of Fermanagh and South Tyrone in Northern Ireland. A coalition group called the Anti-H-Block Committee put forward Sands as a candidate for the newly opened seat. The campaign to elect Sands together with his highly publicized hunger strike became a rallying point around which the Irish Republican movement united around and it served to reshape the narrative with which the Troubles had been described by the British. Sands' selfless sacrifice made it harder and harder to dismiss the actions of the Irish Liberation Movement as terrorism or mere criminal behavior as the British government tried to portray them. The Troubles came to be seen more as a political conflict between the forces of oppression and those seeking basic human rights. The slogan for Sands' successful campaign was, His life in your hands, vote Bobby Sands. About two weeks after his victory, Sands perished on the 66th day of his agonizing hunger strike. More than 100,000 people in Northern Ireland, a region with a population of 600,000 Catholics, would attend his funeral. Nine more hunger strikers will also meet the same fate as Bobby Sands and the troubles in Northern Ireland would continue for almost two more decades. For this episode of History of Elections, I want to explore the motives and accomplishments of a decidedly unconventional campaign to elect a dying man to political office. I will, of course, try to provide the context for this extraordinary movement. We will see, for example, 
How the campaign to elect Sands mobilized Republican Catholics to reassess their practice of abstaining in the electoral process and to vote for the first time. Before Sands, the strategy of the Republican movement was to boycott elections which they deemed illegitimate. After his victory and death, the Republican Party Sinn Féin would change their strategy and run elections everywhere they could. Over time, they would slowly build power and legitimacy. Sands' election was a turning point that would place Sinn Féin on a trajectory which would make them the most popular political party in Northern Ireland today. But I also want to try to answer a very difficult and perhaps somewhat inflammatory question. To what degree did Sands' sacrifice have a positive impact for his cause and why? From the conventional perspective, his campaign did not succeed by at least two measures. If the goal of an election is to send a representative to govern on the behalf of his constituency, well, that of course did not happen as he could not even physically leave the H-Block prison. But that of course was not the goal of Sands or the anti-H-Block committee. They were utilizing electoral politics for publicity and not to have Sands as an actual representative that would serve his constituency in Westminster. So. What about Sands' goal for him and his fellow nine inmates to be treated as political prisoners? After a four month period that saw 10 men, all of them in their 20s, perish one by one from starvation, the British government refused to budge and Prime Minister Thatcher continued to characterize them as criminals. What's more, while the hunger strike had engaged in the ultimate form of nonviolent resistance, their deaths were followed by an increase in violence and killings by the IRA and many Catholics were growing skeptical of the usefulness of nonviolent resistance. So that's the short term result, a failure to have their demands recognized and an aggravation of the violence. But what about the long term? Didn't the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 bring peace to Northern Ireland? And wasn't the hunger strike a major part of the struggle that eventually led to the end of the troubles? Sands and his comrades landed in prison for their role in the battle to free Ireland from British rule. Judged from that ultimate objective, the Good Friday Agreement may have ended the years of bloodshed, but it did not unite the two Irelands. In other words, the troubles did not end in a decisive victory for the cause to which Sands had dedicated his life. Whether you are an Irish nationalist or a listener who may just be hearing about Bobby Sands for the very first time, it is human nature to want to believe that his courageous and selfless sacrifice was not in vain, that its goals were achieved, that some lasting good came from it. But extreme form of nonviolent civil disobedience only sometimes result in success. To use a famous example, Mohamed Bouazizi, the Tunisian protester who set himself on fire in 2011, triggered a wave of revolutions known as the Arab Spring across two continents. Now, compare that example with Wynne Bruce, a climate activist who also set himself on fire in April 2022 in front of the US Supreme Court. While Mohamed Bouazizi is now memorialized all over Tunisia for his role his sacrifice played in his country's movement towards democracy, no one remembers Win Bruce. Despite his sacrifice and the importance for the issue for which he died, Bruce's death has not resulted in any mass mobilization or tangible gains. No matter how much we might honor Win Bruce, we must conclude that his action may not have been worth it that he may have died in vain. So in this episode, we will take a closer look at Bobby Sands' campaign and we will seek to answer an uncomfortable question. Did Bobby Sands and the nine other hunger strikers who followed him suffer and die in vain? I hope by the end, we will not only learn of the story of the historic Bobby Sands campaign, but also understand when, why, and how campaigns centering on extreme forms of civil disobedience succeed. By examining the implications of his story within a broader context, 
we can perhaps learn more about the advantages and limits of civil disobedience and the dynamics created when such acts merge with a radical electoral campaign. Bernadette Devlin, a Catholic MP representing Northern Ireland's Mid-Ulster constituency, was flying back to London for an emergency session in Westminster. The day before, Devlin had witnessed British paratroopers gunning down 14 unarmed Catholic protesters in the city of Derry. The slaughter became known as Bloody Sunday. As the only member of parliament to have witnessed the massacre, she knew that the future of Northern Ireland rested on her shoulders. She had to tell her fellow legislators, and indeed, the rest of the world, how a peaceful demonstration for voting rights, as well as an end to job and housing discrimination, was met with bullets from the 1st Battalion Parachute Regiment. The same regiment had been responsible for killing at least nine civilians five months earlier, but Devlin knew that this time was different. The British had gone too far on Bloody Sunday and had perhaps pushed the Catholic residents of Northern Ireland to a breaking point. To bear witness to Bloody Sunday would have been a daunting responsibility for anyone, but perhaps especially for Devlin, who, at the time, was not only one of the very few women in the UK Parliament, she was also its youngest member. Elected in 1969 as a socialist seeking to unite Catholics and Protestants through shared working class issues, Devlin was the youngest woman ever seated in the House of Commons. But she was, at least, a gifted orator. After her very first speech in Parliament, delivered on her 22nd birthday, she was praised by one journalist for having delivered the finest maiden speech since Benjamin Disraeli in 1837. Devlin was also no stranger to violence, having built barricades alongside other Catholics during the Battle of the Bog Side in the summer of 1969. This three-day period of unrest was an important catalyst for the start of the decades-long troubles. Devlin was there and saw firsthand how the police terrorized the Catholic population. In another dangerous brush with violence, a peaceful protest that Devlin had organized was attacked by Unionist vigilantes as they marched from Belfast to Derry. She barely escaped with her life. As she raced back to Westminster to tell the world what had happened on Bloody Sunday, Devlin did what she could to keep herself together. In the almost all boys club of Westminster, Devlin had the reputation of a troublemaker, having already been convicted and sentenced to serve six months in jail for her role in the Battle of the Bogside. Among her supporters back home, she was hailed as Northern Ireland's Joan of Arc. For the English, she was about as popular as the original Joan of Arc. Devlin knew that when she rose to speak, she would be completely alone in Parliament with no one to support her and with the Tory-backed House Speaker refusing to give her time. The so-called debate for the emergency session opened with remarks from the Conservative Home Secretary Reginald Maudling, who immediately made the false claim that British troops had acted in self-defense after coming under fire from the IRA. Devlin rose several times to refute this version of events. When she was ignored, she raised a point of order. Is it in order? she asked for the minister to get up in this house unchallenged and tell lies. The house speaker responded, saying that she must not call a member of parliament a liar and must withdraw her statement. I will withdraw the word but not the sentiment, Devlin hit back, but I assert my right as the only eyewitness to speak. Although Devlin was absolutely correct in her understanding of parliamentary practice, the House Speaker tried once again to shut her down. The Honorable Lady of Mid-Ulster has no rights other than those given to her by the Speaker, he said smugly. Devlin then corrected the Tory House Speaker, who apparently was under the impression that it was wise for an Englishman to tell an Irish woman she had no rights. 
The Honorable Lady of Mid Ulster, she said, referring to herself, has whatever rights in the house it is within her power to exert. Rising from her seat, she strode across the floor of the House of Commons and smacked the Home Secretary Reginald Maudling with her fist. Devlin was, subsequently, vilified by the British press for being unladylike. And about two years later, she would lose her seat in Parliament. But Devlin did not regret giving up her career in government in that one moment of rage. Years later, she would say that her only regret was that she didn't hit modeling hard enough. As I mentioned a moment ago, Devlin's slap came at a pivotal moment in the Troubles, and it was perfectly consistent with the changes taking place among great many of Northern Ireland's Catholics, who, after Bloody Sunday, began to question the efficiency of their largely non-violent resistance movement. Just as Devlin had reached a personal breaking point on the floor of the House of Commons, Northern Irish Catholics were collectively reaching their own. One of the witnesses of Bloody Sunday was a priest named Father Edward Daly. There is a famous photo of him escorting an injured and bloodied protester. Reflecting on the changes in people's thinking brought by that day, Father Daly remarked, A lot of younger people in Derry, who may have been more pacifist, became quite militant as a result of it. People who were there on that day and who saw what happened was absolutely enraged by it and just wanted to seek some kind of revenge for it. In the later years, many young people I visited in prison told me quite explicitly that they would never have become involved in the IRA but for what they witnessed and heard happening on Bloody Sunday. Before the year was out, the IRA would carry out its first bombing on the British mainland since the start of the Troubles. The nature of the conflict changed. What had begun as a peaceful civil rights movement was radically transformed as violent and increasingly sensational attacks became more popular with the resistance. In the process, the movement, indeed the very cause for which Northern Ireland's Catholics were fighting, was successfully rebranded by British propaganda. Sporadic and shocking attacks by the IRA enabled the British government to recast the troubles in Northern Ireland as nothing more than the barbaric activities of a small minority of violent criminals. The troubles were no longer about civil or human rights, it was a matter of lawlessness and disorderly troublemakers. Civil rights leaders like Bernadette Devlin toured America and made TV appearances in order to remind international audiences of their cause, but British propaganda proved to be too formidable. One of the important responses of the British government to the rise in IRA attacks was the elimination of something called special category status. This change, which was announced in 1976, meant that anyone whom the British deemed as terrorist would be seen not as a political prisoner, but as a common criminal and that person would be treated accordingly. This may seem like a trivial matter of semantics, but it became a critical flashpoint for the prisoner protest which culminated in the hunger strikes of 1981. Jerry Adams of Sinn Féin criticized the new policy pointing out how British propaganda was merely pretending that the political struggle in Northern Ireland, quote, had ceased to exist and that the British were only faced with the conspiracy of a few criminals. Although Jerry Adams recognized the meaning of the new policy, his political party, Sinn Féin, did not immediately recognize it as the galvanizing issue it eventually became. Bernadette Devlin, on the other hand, along with the socialist organization People's Democracy, approached Sinn Féin with a proposal to run a joint campaign to defend political status for prisoners. But Sinn Féin rebuffed the idea. By September of 1976, however, Sinn Féin's disinterest in organizing a campaign around the issue of political status was a moot point. It was then that imprisoned IRA volunteer Kieran Nugent staged the first blanket protest 
To draw attention to the question of political status, Nugent refused to wear a prison uniform and wrapped himself up in a blanket as his only clothing. While groups outside the prison walls continued to temporize, by 1977, as many as 200 prisoners had taken Nugent's cue and had joined a blanket or no wash protest. By January of 1978, as prisoner-led protests escalated, organizers outside the prisons finally got together for a conference with the newly formed Anti-H Block Committee. They came from a diverse group of political parties, from Republicans in Sinn Féin, moderates in the Social Democratic Labour Party, and radical Marxists in People's Democracy. After some factional disagreements, they put their differences aside to support a campaign for the men and women languishing in British-run prisons. While there was a consensus that something had to be done on the question of political status for prisoners, these groups struggled to agree on the best tactics to deploy. One key sticking point was the option to advance the prisoners' cause through electoral politics. With an upcoming election for the European Parliament in 1979, the first ever in which residents of Northern Ireland would vote, some groups believed that this was the best opportunity to call attention to the issue of political status for prisoners. It would bypass Westminster and take the prisoners' cause directly to an international legislative body. Sinn Féin, which had long disdained the political process, was not willing to go along. But that did not stop Bernadette Devlin from running as an independent candidate with the purpose of calling attention to the plight of the Irish prisoners. Although she performed quite well, Devlin didn't win, largely due to the lack of unified support from her own side. Sinn Féin, not surprisingly, criticized Devlin and claimed that her run was opportunistic. As we will see, Devlin would be proved right, and even Sinn Féin would eventually rethink their traditional tactic of abstaining from participation in any British institution. This would be one of the most decisive policy changes for this influential group. In addition to Devlin's example, Sinn Féin could also look to a case in which the stubborn but principled policy of abstaining from elections backfired at a great cost. On March 28, 1979, UK Labour Prime Minister James Callaghan faced a vote of no confidence in Parliament. He lost by the narrowest margins, just one vote. The final tally was 311 to 310. Now it is true that special category status had been eliminated under a Labour-led government, but Labour was far away the lesser of evils when it came to sympathy for Irish Catholics among leading British parties. The defeat of a Prime Minister from Labour was a major setback. It ushered in the 11-year leadership of Margaret Thatcher, whose uncompromising style of governing earned her the nickname The Iron Lady. Historians look back at this moment as the end of old labor, which would not take power again until the neoliberal centrist New Labor under Tony Blair 18 years later. As I mentioned, this major turning point in 20th century British politics might never have happened if just one minister voted differently. As it so happens, two MPs who were decidedly sympathetic to the cause of Catholic civil rights in Northern Ireland chose to abstain. These men were Social Democrat Jerry Fitt and the Independent Frank Maguire. You will remember Maguire as the MP whose death would open up a seat in Bobby Sands' constituency. In what is considered one of the most dramatic events in Westminster history, Frank Maguire traveled all the way to London just to abstain in person. To be fair, the Conservatives certainly got a boost when, just one month before the election of Margaret Thatcher, a fellow Conservative MP was assassinated by the Irish National Liberation Army. But the stubborn refusal of pro-Catholic members to vote when it most counted was clearly a crucial mistake for the movement in Northern Ireland. Callaghan's Labour government was succeeded by a ruthless Tory government. 
and Thatcher came into Number 10 Downing Street with a narrow mandate to crack down on Northern Ireland and to concede not an inch. As American civil rights leader Kwame Ture, also known as Stokely Carmichael, famously stated, in order for nonviolence to work, your opponent must have a conscience. In the bloody sea of the troubles in 1971, Labor Party leader Harold Wilson, a once and future prime minister, put forward a plan that would allow for an eventual unification of Ireland. Wilson, of course, did not follow through on uniting the two Irelands when he briefly served again as Prime Minister from 1974 to 1976. Still, his proposal suggested an opening, that labor could perhaps be moved if enough pressure were exerted. Labor, for all its shortcomings, at least had a conscience. But Thatcher, it must be said, had no conscience. She bore the reputation of the Iron Lady proudly. Her refusal to be moved by non-violent resistance would lead to more death as the Republican movement in Northern Ireland was forced to use other means in its struggle. The National Anti-H Bloc Arma Committee had been formed in order to advocate from the outside for the men and women incarcerated respectively in H Bloc prison maze and Arma. By the autumn of 1980, four years into the blanket protests, with no results, the idea of a hunger strike began circulating among the prisoners of H Block. They had a famous historical model for such a protest. Terence McSweeney, the mayor of Cork during the Irish War of Independence in the 1920s, famously went on a 74-day hunger strike that ended up mobilizing the Irish into political action. About a year after McSweeney's death, the Irish would succeed in liberating the majority of their country. Perhaps a new hunger strike, 60 years after McSweeney's, would do the same. The prisoners also understood that a hunger strike could quicken the consciousness of the Irish people to mobilize them into action by evoking the memory of Britain's greatest crime against the Irish. The Great Famine in the mid-19th century resulted in a million Irish deaths in a country of barely a few million. It was brought on by unfair trade laws as well as the appropriation of all fertile land by Protestant absentee landlords. It was a genocide by negligence that the Irish never forgot. Every Irish person understands what it means to go hungry at the hands of the British. The prisoners knew what had to be done. They knew how to galvanize the Irish into action. And so the decision was made. For understandable reasons, the members of the National Anti-H Bloc Arma Committee were not enthusiastic about the idea of a hunger strike. They did not want to endorse a plan that would put the prisoners through a prolonged and agonizing death. Sinn Féin wanted to avoid a hunger strike at all costs. But the prisoners felt they had no other option. The blanket protest had not worked. It was time to raise the stakes. For their supporters outside the prison, the hunger strike was a horrifying prospect, but the need to show solidarity was equally acute. On October 26, 1980, Bernadette Devlin led a march of 17,000 protesters in Belfast in a strong show of support for the political prisoners. After 11 years of stagnation, the non-violent civil rights movement in Northern Ireland was showing new signs of life. It was an emotional event. A journalist who was there noted the tears of joy that ran down Devlin's face. The morning after the march, seven IRA volunteers imprisoned in H Block started a hunger strike. In a symbolic link to the past, between the men in H Block and their patriotic forebearers, the prisoners opted for seven hunger strikers because this was the same as the number of signatories to the Easter Proclamation of 1916 which triggered the Irish War of Independence. 
On December 1st, the hunger strike by male prisoners of each block was joined by three female IRA volunteers in the Arma Women's Prison. The hunger strike began in October of 1980, ended on December 18th after 53 days, just as some of the hunger strikers were on the verge of death. The decision to call off the strikes came after a nebulous offer from the British government which the prisoners thought might eventually lead to political status. But in the end, it was merely a bluff by Thatcher. Having failed in their first attempt, the prisoners now planned for a second wave of hunger strikes. And this one would be different. Rather than have several prisoners strike simultaneously, the new plan was for them to begin their hunger strikes in succession, one at a time. This would prolong the duration of the collective strike in order to keep attention fixated on their protest. The second wave of strikes began on March 1st, 1981 with 26-year-old IRA volunteer Bobby Sands. While Bobby Sands is the protagonist of this episode, and while his name is well known to anyone familiar with modern Irish history, the truth is that Bobby Sands is a bit of a mystery, partly because he didn't live a long life. By 1981, when he was serving a 14-year prison sentence for illegal weapons possession, Sands had already spent a quarter of his young life behind bars. Viewers of the video version of this episode have no doubt noticed that I keep using the same photo of Sands. This is because there simply aren't many photos of him as a free man. What we know of Bobby Sands must be pieced together from different sources. Much of the most illuminating and moving of these are his own writings, which include articles he wrote under the pen name Marcella, as well as some poems he wrote in prison before his death. One can also read his short autobiography, One Day in My Life, which he wrote during the blanket protest using toilet paper he had hidden in his body. For now, it is enough to note that there was one critical issue on which Bobby Sands differed from other members of the IRA or Sinn Féin, and that was his view on electoral politics. Sands believed that every available means had to be used to build their movement to smash H-Bloc, including running a campaign for elected office. This put him at odds with Sinn Féin leadership, which, as we have seen, participated in the conventional political process only to the extent that they could express their belief in the illegitimacy of Westminster in the government of the Irish people. Sand's embrace of every means necessary also made him willing to commit to the most extreme form of civil disobedience. When Sinn Féin leader Jerry Adams pleaded with Sands to not start a second wave of hunger strikes, Sands was not swayed. As I mentioned earlier, the hunger strikes were planned and coordinated for maximum effect. But the chance to run for a seat in Parliament was fortuitous. The sudden death of MP Frank McGuire offered an ideal opportunity to strike an embarrassing blow against the British establishment. Even for those opposed to the hunger strike and averse to political participation, the idea of placing Bobby Sands on the ballot proved irresistible it would raise even greater public awareness for their cause. Exactly who came up with the idea to run Sands is a subject of debate. Bernadette Devlin maintains that the first person to make the suggestion was a member of the anti-H-Block committee named Patsy O'Neill. O'Neill's original plan, which predated Maguire's death, was to force the current MP to retire in order to make the seat available for Sands. Whatever debt is owed to Patsy O'Neill, it is evident that his plan would never have gotten off the ground were it not for the efforts of Devlin herself. Because by that time, Devlin had already organized local anti-H-Block Arma groups in every county in Ireland. Even before Maguire's death, she had set up the organizational structure for a campaign such as the one that would be used for Bobby Sands. Devlin's contributions to the cause did not go unnoticed, including by the Unionists. On January 16th, a month and a half before the Bobby Sands campaign launched, a Unionist vigilante shot Devlin several times in her own home in front of her small children. 
British soldiers, who had been stationed near Devlin's home to monitor her activities, did not intervene when the attack took place. Miraculously, Devlin survived. Five days later, the IRA retaliated for the attack on Devlin by assassinating a unionist politician named Norman Strange and his son. The anti-H Bloc committee called upon their supporters to remain nonviolent and they denounced the revenge killings. But it was hard to control the frustration and anger that many were feeling. After the assassination of Norman Strange, the IRA released a statement to the British telling them to call off their dogs and threatened to deal not only with the dogs but also with their masters. A month after getting shot multiple times, Bernadette Devlin had recovered enough to attend the funeral services for Frank McGuire. While there, she hinted to the Irish Times that she was considering running for McGuire's seat. This in fact was not her intention at all, as she was already plotting to have Bobby Sands put forward as a candidate. The idea of running herself was just a backup plan in case the Sands campaign fell through. One early potential obstacle was Frank McGuire's brother, Noel, who expressed an interest in running for his brother's former seat, a move which would have split the vote. Once the idea of Sands' campaign was put forward, and Noel was informed that it was the only way of saving Bobby Sands' life, the other McGuire backed down. Another real concern for the anti ace Bloc committee was the unpreparedness of the ordinary people of Fermanagh and South Tyrone. After so many years of abstaining from elections, there were fears that the voters could not be mobilized in time. The committee even assumed that they would need to send a party expert from Belfast to give local organizers a crash course in electoral politics. What they discovered, to their delighted amazement, was that the Catholic population in Fermanagh and South Tyrone had almost secretly been preparing for just such an election. Despite the long-standing militant Republican rejection of electoral politics, the Catholics of the local constituency were registered, organized, and already trained to run a campaign. Almost from the shadows, they had infiltrated institutional positions from which they could also supervise the count to make sure the results were fair. They had even carried out a successful campaign to thwart British efforts to conduct a potentially subversive census before the election. Don't return it, burn it, they urged their neighbors when they received the census in their mail. As one anti h Block committee leader recalled, they were brilliant. The stage was set for the campaign of Bobby Sands for the seat in the legislative body of the government that currently held him captive. Sands himself characterized his campaign in terms that placed it beyond his own individual struggle. It was, as he put it, a fight for the right of human dignity for Irish men and women who are imprisoned for taking part in this period of this historical struggle for Irish independence. Clearly, he saw his campaign as part of an 800 year long battle against British domination over Ireland. But there's no question that the galvanizing force behind his win was sympathy for his personal pain and struggle. It goes without saying that both incarceration and physical incapacity prevented Sands from campaigning on his own behalf. At this stage in the hunger strike, he could barely move as starvation eroded his strength and ability to function. But the working class people in Fermanagh and South Tyrone, as well as organizers of the anti h Block committee, carried his message to voters and led to his surprising victory. On April 9, 1981, Bobby Sands defeated Unionist Harry West by 1,500 votes. Sands was now a prisoner, a registered terrorist, and a member of the British Parliament. More importantly, with the anti h Block movement, he had proven that he had the people behind him. As much as Thatcher tried to downplay Sands' achievement, 
The victory was a massive embarrassment for the Tory government, who found it harder and harder to escape the attention of international leaders to the troubles of Northern Ireland. After three Irish ministers to the European Parliament met with Bobby Sands during his hunger strike, they requested an urgent meeting with the Thatcher government. Thatcher responded, It is not my habit or custom to meet MPs from a foreign country about a citizen of the United Kingdom. Suddenly, Ireland had become a foreign place for the English. Among other visitors to Bobby Sands during his hunger strike was a Labour Party spokesperson from Northern Ireland, who, after the visit, promised support on the criminalization issue if their party was to take government. Labour, of course, did not come into power again for many years, but this show of support was yet another indication that the prisoners' petition may have been more effective if directed at a government with a conscience. In other words, had it not been for Thatcher's government, the protest might have succeeded in its main demands. On April 27th, a few weeks after Bobby Sands' victory, the Ulster police carried out a massive sweep of the homes of the anti-H Bloc committee members. The committee afterwards released a statement to its supporters to continue in a peaceful manner and in such a fashion so as to not alienate the local community. Thatcher had tried, but could not break their will. But the people had their limit, and they would soon reach the point where calls for non-violence from the anti-H Bloc committee were ignored. On May 5th, 66 days into his hunger strike, and just a few weeks after winning a seat in Parliament, Bobby Sands died. As soon as his death was announced at 1.30 a.m., Irish ghettos across Northern Ireland descended into chaos and rioting. People rang sirens, banged trash cans, and made sure their cries were loud enough for the rest of the world to hear. Even south of the border in the city of Dublin, so many protesters flooded the streets that the Irish army had to be placed on standby. No fewer than 100,000 people attended Bobby Sands' funeral. It was the biggest IRA funeral since that of Terence McSweeney of 1920. McSweeney, as you will recall, was the Irish Republican whose death by hunger strike brought international attention to the Irish struggle for independence. Sands had now joined the pantheon of Irish martyrs who had died on starvation at the hands of the British. The collective anger that the Irish felt after Sands' death was deeply rooted in their history. Almost every person living in Ireland today is descended from a survivor of the Great Potato Famine. The same can be said for much of the Irish American population as well. Bobby Sands' protest against the British addressed the whole of the historical injustice against Ireland and it was conveyed in an action that resonated within the collective memory of the past. This is how the movement went from a few radical demonstrators at its inception to a crowd of 100,000 people crying in the streets. But the hunger strike was far from over. Nine other prisoners in H Block followed Bobby Sands, and the anti-H Block committee to keep the momentum going ran even more prisoners as candidates. Socialist groups like People's Democracy and others associated with the movement performed quite well in subsequent city council elections in Northern Ireland. Owen Caron, a Republican nationalist, would also win back Bobby Sands' seat after his death with even wider margins. The anti h Bloc Committee even ran candidates in the Republic of Ireland. On June 11th, two h Bloc prisoners, Kieran Doherty and Paddy Agnew, won seats in the Irish legislature. Kieran would last 73 days on hunger strike. But after Joe McDonnell, the fifth hunger striker to die, the movement had to face a disturbing realization. While it was true that they were having electoral success and earning high levels of public support, the anti h Bloc movement had to concede that the unionist establishment and the British government were still not budgeting at all. It got worse as the sixth hunger striker, Martin Herson, was nearing his own death a week after McDonnell. 
By then, the public was well aware of the excruciating pain experienced by the hunger strikers in their final days, when even the slightest sound could increase the agony. Capitalizing on this, unionist extremist groups known as Orangemen gathered outside of the H Block prison, loudly banging drums to torture Herson in his final hours. From the heartless cruelty of the Orangemen, we get a sense of the angry reaction that the hunger strike elicited from the unionist side. This anger translated into votes, and as a result, the far right of the unionist wing was able to gain as much traction with its base as the Catholic Republicans were able to do with theirs. The hunger strikers were clearly not melting the hearts of their opponents. They were, in fact, making them even more extreme in their determination to maintain unionist and Protestant domination over Northern Ireland. After the youngest hunger striker, 23-year-old Thomas McElwee died, the anti-H Bloc movement realized that their demands for political status would not be met no matter how many electoral victories they achieved. On October 3, 1981, the hunger strike was called off. The anti-H Bloc committee made their announcement late on a Saturday after the Sunday press had already gone out. It was a small attempt to postpone and perhaps temper the glee they knew the news would be met by the British media. On October 6, the British announced that all prisoners would be allowed to wear any clothes they wanted. This was not the concession to the prisoner's demand as they implied no recognition of the IRA inmates as political prisoners. It was merely a bit of a deflection and propaganda on the part of the British who would continue to masquerade the troubles as a simple criminal issue. All this was a quiet and anticlimactic ending for the anti-H block movement. So now, it is time to revisit the question asked at the beginning of this episode. Did Bobby Sands die in vain? To what degree did Sands' sacrifice have a positive impact for his cause, and why? Let's begin with the legacy of the anti-H Block Committee. As its members were, after all, the force behind Sands' campaign if not the hunger strike itself. Although the anti-H Block Committee disbanded, the two factions that were most opposed to electoral campaigns were, ironically, the groups that benefited the most. I am referring to the IRA and Sinn Féin. Contrary to what most people think, the IRA did not always enjoy strong support among Northern Ireland's Catholic population. In fact, the IRA were often mocked during the early period of the Troubles with a joke that claimed that their acronym IRA stood for I Ran Away. In the months after the hunger strikes concluded, two of their mixed results led to a jump in IRA membership and terrorist activity. On one hand, the failure of the non-violent campaign to sway British attitudes made more dispossessed Catholics to accept violence as a means to achieve their ends. At the same time, the elevation of one of their own to hero status, Sands of course, having been an IRA volunteer, helped re-establish the credibility of the IRA. This, in turn, seems to have emboldened the group to increase its militant activities, true to their pledge to deal with their masters if the British refused to call off their dogs, the IRA would even come close to assassinating Margaret Thatcher in the Brighton Hotel bombing of October 12, 1984. The other faction that benefited greatly from Sands' campaign was Sinn Féin. Although Sinn Féin previously adhered to its traditional policy of boycotting elections, the Sands campaign led them to make a complete 180 turnabout. They were now determined to run candidates wherever and whenever they could. Although it was a slow evolution starting in 1981, Sinn Féin is now, in 2022, the most popular political party in Northern Ireland. The Bobby Sands campaign had awakened them to the idea that electoral politics is worth it after all. 
It is a shame, however, that this lesson was not learned before Bobby Sands began his hunger strike. As I mentioned earlier, two MPs from Northern Ireland abstained when they might have saved a Labour government in 1979. If these ministers had voted differently, the hunger strikes might have been carried out under a more conscientious Labour government, and this might have led to a different outcome. After all, it was a Labour government led by Tony Blair that would eventually sign the Good Friday Agreement that finally put an end to the troubles, and introduced proportional representation and power sharing between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland. Following the declaration of Kwame Ture, I have maintained throughout this episode that Margaret Thatcher's cold hard ruthlessness was a major reason for the failure of Sands' martyrdom to change British policy. However, the blame can also be shared by the United States and the European community as well. Throughout the hunger strike, anti-H Bloc committee spokespeople, from Bernadette Devlin to the first blanket man Kieran Nugent, toured North America and European countries in an appeal for solidarity. The response fell short of expectations. Although modeled after the American Civil Rights Movement, the effort to smash H Block and garner international support for the oppressed Catholics in Northern Ireland was hampered by a key difference in their respective circumstances. Though less obvious, this difference helps explain how the earlier movement in the United States succeeded in its goals while the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland disintegrated into violence. One of the key reasons why the American civil rights movement succeeded was the Cold War and the desire of the liberal establishment in the US government to placate foreign critics. It was well understood in American intellectual and political circles that images of black people getting lynched or bitten by police dogs provided the Soviets with a rich source of anti-Western propaganda. This was not only an embarrassment, at a time when the Soviets were trying to convince newly independent countries into their sphere of influence, it was a matter of national security. As much as it was a moral blight, the conditions of African Americans in the segregated South and elsewhere was a weak spot for the American political establishment. Moreover, the leaders of the civil rights movement in the US were well aware of the perception of vulnerability and they deliberately tried to exploit it to their advantage. Civil rights leaders like W.B. Du Bois, James Farmer, James Baldwin in The Fire Next Time, as well as former Attorney General Robert Kennedy and Secretary of State Dean Rusk, all commented that civil rights legislation needed to pass to placate international critics and quote-unquote hostile propaganda from the Cold War. Many historians now understand that the dynamics of the Cold War was crucial for the American civil rights movement to embarrass the country and to put enough international pressure on the US, partly its more liberal factions, to force a change in its policy. But Northern Ireland's civil rights movement did not have the benefit of a geopolitical conflict like the Cold War to leverage in its favor it was impossible to alarm leaders in the US and elsewhere into taking action to pressure the British. Not only that, the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland consisted of radical Marxists and socialists. With Ronald Reagan in the White House, one can well imagine the unlikelihood of persuading the United States to intervene. Although it did not succeed in its stated goals, we can say at the very least that Bobby Sands' campaign was successful at revitalizing the Republican cause in Northern Ireland. And it did show that electoral politics had its proper place in the movement. These may seem like modest victories given the scale of the sacrifice, but there is an important lesson to be learned. What organizers today can learn from Bobby Sands is that there is no reason why one shouldn't use every means available to popularize a cause and that includes electoral politics. Certainly, the hunger strike was a bold and dramatic course of action, but we must acknowledge that the role the campaign for the British Parliament had in elevating the protest. It was the combination of these two that strengthened the movement and brought nearly one-sixth of the Catholic population of Northern Ireland into the streets in only a matter of a few months. Many radicals on the left in the US 
dismiss electoral politics, usually because they deem the two major political parties to be illegitimate with no real intention to advocate for working class interests. It is a principled stance not to be complicit in a corrupt system. But it was exactly that sort of unbending commitment that led Sinn Féin and other Irish Republicans to squander critical opportunities to advance their cause, to abstain or boycott on principle when their votes could have been decisive. Bobby Sands understood that winning by any means necessary was a far better way to advance one's cause than the misguided preference for ideological purity. Results trump the urge to spare oneself the taint of a toxic political process. Electoral politics does not make oneself any less radical. Finally, to answer the difficult question we first posed at the beginning of this episode, did Bobby Sands die in vain? Judged from only immediate and tangible goals, then the answer is yes. The deaths of Bobby Sands and nine others failed to win the main demand of being classified as political prisoners. They died before any concessions were made by the British. Furthermore, by exposing the heartlessness of lawmakers in London and the cruelty of their Protestant neighbors, the nonviolent hunger strike led to even more violence. But there were intangible and more enduring changes brought by Bobby Sands and his campaign. When judged by these standards, we must then say that Bobby Sands did not die in vain. To reach this conclusion, we must view Bobby Sands' martyrdom from the perspective greater in scale than a few limited political concessions. There is no better way for us to gain this perspective than through Bobby Sands' own words. As I mentioned, Sands was a writer and a poet. His writings have been archived and still can be read from the Bobby Sands Trust. One of the selections we can read on their website is a poem Sands composed before his death. It is titled, The Rhythm of Time, and is worth quoting in its entirety. From the vantage point of a million years, Sands' poem chronicles the heroes in the struggle against injustice. Composed by a man wrecked by the agonizing pangs of starvation and the approach of death, it is unmistakable affirmation of hope and confidence in the righteousness of his cause. Bobby Sands situates his battle and sacrifice within a centuries-long tradition of courage and selfless dedication to justice. His is a struggle that goes beyond Ireland's 800-year conflict with the British. It claims fellowship with all those who have stood up for what is right and were willing to pay the ultimate price. Bobby Sands' own words provide the answer we are seeking. His death was hardly a tragic failure. It was a timeless victory for hope.